what came out of my time uh, working in Mick Follow's group, um, and I got a lot of help from Steph Bukowitz and uh, Oliver Yarn as well. And I should probably thank Philip Boyd as well for um, pointing out that mixed, modeling mixed trophies difficulty, because I started working on this in 2009 and only got it published in 2016. So that's use that as an excuse. So this is a, a video of, um, well, of uh, two organisms that sort of frame our, our view of marine ecosystems based on our view of the terrestrial ecosystem. So we think of this dichotomy between plants and animals, um, and that's how we model marine ecosystems traditionally. Um, so here we've got this pigmented, large pigmented organisms, a dinoflagellate. Um, it's packed full of photosynthetic pigments, so looking at it, you might put it in that plant box. And this is a heterotrophic ciliate that is known to consume other organisms. But if I press play on this video, you can see that the photosynthetic plant animal has stuck a tube into the, into the animal and it's basically sucking out its inside. So this is what mixotrophy is. Um, this is a video from, from Park, uh, published in 2006. So again, going back to that false dichotomy, um, this is a paper from Kevin Flynn showing how we um, put organisms in the marine food web into boxes um, by functional group or by species or taxonomic group. Um, and those groups are then clumped into bigger boxes of phagotrophs on the left here and phototrophs on the right. Um, and they argue quite convincingly that this is not really what the ecosystem looks like with maybe things like forams and, and radiolar occasionally showing mixotrophy and, and diana dinoflagellates being occasional mixotrophy. Um, what we've got is a much more fluid um, division. It's more like a spectrum between autotrophy and heterotrophy. And everything is occupying all points along that spectrum except, uh, except maybe diatoms, which have uh, not been shown to show any form of mixotrophy yet. Um, so, spoiler alert, I'm going to tell you what happens when I run the mixotrophic model. Um, so, mixed trophs we know are ubiquitous. Um, they take up 80% of pigmented biomass in some regions, um, but then they're also um, doing a major amount of grazing on, on bacteria, and they play a major role in increasing ecological efficiency and carbon export. And the way I frame this is that we've got this food web here, um, and the traditional view is that um, you've got new nutrients being upwelled into the surface layer, we have production and consumption and remineralization in the microbial loop. Basically, in a steady state system, what's going to go up uh, in nutrients is going to come down again in nutrients, and that's going to be coupled to carbon. Adam Martini made a very convincing point that the, uh, the coupling between carbon and, and the nutrients is, is very important, and that's more flexible. But also, we can see that this dichotomy makes a difference as well. So a lot of these organisms that are classified as phytoplankton or classified as zooplankton are, in fact, mixotrophs, and that is giving an extra source of carbon into the system that's not at the base of the food web and is not necessarily tied to the new production in the same way. And uh, our paper shows uh, that I did with Mick Follows that this can increase the mean organism size by two to three times in the community, and it can increase, increase carbon export by 20 to 35%. Um, so to outline the rest of my talk, um, first of all, I'm going to talk about a size-structured ecosystem model that runs at the global scale, what goes into that model um, in terms of the physiological and ecological assumptions. Uh, I'm going to show uh, ways of breaking down that complex model to show what is driving its behavior in terms of the physical forcing, the physiological assumptions we make about the organisms, and the ecology of those organisms. Um, then I'm going to go on to those ecological and biochemical effects of mixotrophy that I just outlined and um, talk about one possible way forward and providing better constraints on those models. So this is the basic structure of the model. Um, it's crudely an MPZD model. Um, and this is the version with phytoplankton and zooplankton. So there's no mixotrophs in these initial runs that I'll show you. Um, and within those groups, we've got many different limiting nutrients. So we've got three different types of nitrogen. We've got iron. And in later runs of the model, we'll also have phosphorus. Um, and then within the phytoplankton, we've got a load of different size classes. Um, and they have different pools for carbon, iron, nitrogen, chlorophyll, and, and sometimes phosphorus. And they're graced by different size classes of zooplankton. As Steph was talking about this morning, they're parameterized allometrically. So it is not as complex in terms of the number of parameters as it looks in this diagram. Um, so parametrically, um, it has approximately the same complexity as a 2NPZD model. 
So it's not adding that extra un uncertainty. Uh, in terms of the phytoplankton and zooplankton physiology, the phytoplankton is based on the GUIDA model that was uh, discussed this morning. Um, so we have uh, uptake of limiting nutrients. We have um, acclimation of the chlorophyll pigments um, according to that um, balancing of uh, carbon synthesis and, and nitrogen availability. Um, we have these different quotas. Uh, and we have put in a, a heterotrophic zooplankton using a similar sort of a related physiology, but basically they're taking up prey according to the amount of carbon in the prey, and they're keeping hold of what they need to balance their stoichiometry, and they're get, getting rid of the rest. And that's, that uh, egestion of excess nutrients is an important point that I'll come back to later in the talk. Again, this allometric parameterization. Um, we uh, can look here at two key physiological traits. So this is uh, at the top, we've got the nitrate affinity. So this is the, basically the competitive ability for um, nitrogen at low concentrations. I plotted that against plankton size. And you can see that the affinity goes down as you get bigger. And this is to do with various um, trade-offs with size and diffusion and surface area. Um, so it's better to be a small plankton in this case for higher affinity. And this is growth rate from, this is all data from Kyle Edwards, by the way. Um, maximum growth rate is showing the same sort of trend. Um, so I plotted them against each other here. And uh, note that, so we've got affinity here, and that's going up towards the left on this axis. Uh, and then maximum growth rate here. And these are different size classes of phytoplankton. So you can see the big ones are in this uh, corner where they've got low affinities and slow growth rates. And the small ones are in this corner where they've got high affinities and high growth rates. So it's really much better to be small in every way in this, uh, in this setup. So why are there any big cells? Um, it's this role of the zooplankton. Um, we've got this idea that the big fish eat the little fish. Um, so we have a different size classes have a particular preference for different size classes of prey. Um, and we can sort of uh, rationalize this using this data here. This is the reaction distance. This is basically the detectability of prey. Um, and as the prey size gets bigger relative to the predator, the predator, they become more detectable. But at the same time, they just get too big to eat. So if you combine those two effects, we have this optimal predator-prey ratio. And that gives us this um, sort of specificity, specific, size specificity of grazing. Um, so that's um, most of the physiological underpinning of the model. But there's just one more thing I'd like to uh, put in there. Um, and this is, if you look at this uh, maximum growth rate data, if you take this allometry um, back to uh, sort of picoplankton size, prochlorococcus, synecococcus sizes, you're getting growth rates of more than 10 a day. Um, and that's obviously not realistic. Um, so in some work I've done with Emilio Marignon, well, he, he published the data and I've looked at the theory with him, um, but uh, it basically comes down to having a more unimodal um, shape for phytoplankton growth. So the fastest growing are the small diatoms and the, the prokaryotes are generally slower growing. And this gives you a trade-off here. So the larger ones have slow growth rates and no affinities. The intermediate ones have fast growth rates um, and sort of intermediate affinities, but the small ones, they don't have such high growth rates, but they still have this competitive ability. So there's a bit of a trade-off going there, going on there. Um, and just one prediction of this is that um, if you think about this um, maximum photosynthetic rate and compare it to a sort of baseline mortality, uh, if these organisms are limited by light or temperature availability and the whole curve is going down or there's higher mortality, you can see that these um, end members, particularly the small phytoplankton here, are going to get excluded in those harsh environments. So that's a, a prediction of that sort of curve. Um, so then bunging all this into the model, into the global ecosystem model and seeing what the global circulation model and seeing what happens. Um, this is the uh, Darwin model sort of philosophy, but done with this size section model. Um, you just assume that all these size classes, everything is everywhere, and the environment is going to select the winners in different environments. Um, you can run that model forward, and I won't spend too long on this, but you can compare the model output to observations and convince yourself that it's maybe doing a reasonably good job, um, enough for you to have some confidence going forward. Um, obviously not perfect, but maybe good, hopefully good enough. But what I want to go on to, which I think is more interesting, is breaking that model down to see exactly what components of the model are doing what. So I'm going to do a load of different experiments here. And I'm going to start off with this experiment on the left here. This is the what I'm calling the fundamental niche experiment. The fundamental niche 
is the range of environments that an organism can survive in, in the absence of any um, interaction with other organisms or any competition at all. Um, so to do that, we've taken out, um, there's no resource limitation, um, there's no grazing. All that we have here is light limitation and temperature limitation. So in some cases, uh, some, some size classes might find that the light conditions or the temperature conditions are just too harsh for them to survive. So those regions would be outside their fundamental niche. In the next experiment, I'm going to bring in nutrient limitation, but no grazing. And then I'm going to do a few experiments with just one grazer um, grazing these phytoplankton. Um, and uh, that's going to have three configurations. Firstly, the grazer just grazes everything equally. And then there's going to be a configuration where it grazes more preferentially on smaller size classes. Um, and then there'll be a, a configuration where it does sort of what's called active switching. So it's targeting the most abundant species for heavier grazing. Um, and that last case is kind of a parameterization of this uh, food web. Because if you imagine one particular phytoplankton size class becoming particularly abundant, that's just going to increase the abundance of its predator, and that's going to act as a, a negative feedback on its abundance. And then finally, uh, which is what I said I was going to talk about, we'll get on to mixotrophy. So this is the fundamental niche experiment. Um, and when you run this model, things just either grow exponentially forever, or they die um, out exponentially as well. So what the gray regions are, are regions where that size class is growing exponentially, or it's basically surviving. And you can see that most size classes are surviving in most places, but that prediction that I made earlier is coming true. Those very small, slow-growing species are being excluded from those harsh environments because it's just too cold and dark for them to survive there. It's got nothing to do with nutrient limitation or grazing because that's disabled in this version of the model. So then we bring in resource competition, um, no grazing again. And you can see now that we have a more credible model and there's some feedback on their abundances. So we get a steady state uh, sort of quasi steady state solution. And you can see that the very slow growing but high affinity um, species are dominating everywhere inside their realized niche, um, but they can't survive outside their realized niche, as we've already seen. So that next uh, faster growing size class comes in and takes over there. But we're not getting any of these big phytoplankton at all in the absence of grazing, uh, just because they're going to get outcompeted for nutrients. Now we can bring in one grazer, um, and it has uh, no preference for any size class, and we can see that um, it pushes the biomass a little bit forward, a uh, little bit larger, and this is the fastest growing size class here. And this is basically, um, that grazer has increased the overall, mor overall mortality in the system, so that's selecting a bit more for faster growing organisms. But we see nothing bigger than here, because these are a priori worse than everything smaller, because they have <coughs> slower growth rates and lower affinities can then make it a little bit more realistic, again, by adding this uh, sort of size preference. Again, same sort of thing. It's targeting smaller things uh, more aggressively, so that opens up a niche for the larger, slower growing organisms that are getting grazed not quite so hard. We can have the kill the winner mechanism. Again, this is uh, now putting in a, a really um, important uh, ecological mechanism where the best competitors are prevented from taking over all the resources um, because they are um, being attacked more heavily. And then this food web is essentially the same thing, but it's done more explicitly. The kill the, kill the winner is an implicit version of that. So we can identify three um, approximate niches. Um, so we've got the familiar gleaners. Um, these are the high affinity, low growth rate ones. We've got the opportunists that grow um, in blooms or in, in um, environments where there's a high nutrient supply. And then we've got the larger ones, which I'm going to call preppers or survivalists. They're either storing nutrients or avoiding uh, attack by grazers. Um, so they've got very slow growth rates now, but come the uh, post-bloom apocalypse, they'll be the ones that end up surviving. Um, so I'm going to get onto mixotrophy now. And this is the two model runs where we've got the full food web and the, um, the mixotrophic model. And I, as I've added mixotrophy, I've not made the model more complex, so I've just made it less complex. I've got rid of the distinction between phytoplankton and zooplankton, and now I've just got plankton. Um, so each mixotroph has basically the combined traits of the phytoplankton and the zooplankton with no trade-off, and just see what happens. Um, so in the two models, we've got the observations here for chlorophyll and primary production, and we've got the phytoplankton-zooplankton model and the mixotrophy model. And we're not seeing huge differences in these bulk properties like uh, primary production and chlorophyll. 
And even in terms of the seasonal cycle, okay, we get differences at Hawaii, um, that's probably more of a circulation effect, but we're not seeing huge differences in these things. Um, and this is the nutrients as well. So we've got nitrate, phosphate, and iron, um, and we have the two guild model and the mixotrophy model. We're seeing um, a lot of excess nutrients being mocked up here. Um, that's one major effect, but it's not um, huge differences. Where the big differences come in, uh, we're getting a lot bigger phytoplankton in the mixotrophic model. Um, these uncompetitive groups are now grazing on the smaller groups, and that's giving them an advantage. Um, and I'll just try and explain what's happening. Um, I'm gonna, so, just trying to explain how that's working. We've got. Um, so here we've got an autotroph, and to grow it needs light, uh, it needs carbon dioxide, it needs um, it needs uh, nitrogen, and it needs iron. If any one of those resources runs out, like iron in this case, um, that's it. Growth is finished according to at least the von Liebig assumptions that go into this model. Um, so it's finished. It's not going to grow anymore. Uh, the heterotroph, it's going to take up its prey. Um, and if the, its prey is out of stoichiometric balance with it, it's going to adjust what it doesn't need. So it's got this trophic inefficiency. Um, to do, it needs to burn some of the carbon that's ingested for energy, and it also needs to have this stoichiometric balance, which is achieved by getting rid of stuff it's ingested. The mixotroph has, um, is going to take advantage of its, its duality here to, to get rid of some of these problems. If it runs out of iron, um, well, first of all, it has less trophic inefficiency. It doesn't have to burn so much carbon um, because it can get carbon from its prey or it can get carbon from uh, photosynthesis. And if it runs out of any, it can, uh, uh, sorry, it has positive stoichiometric balancing, so if, it's, um, if the, the nutrient supply is out of balance um, and it runs out of iron, it can just get iron from its prey. Um, and it can just achieve this balanced growth in a more efficient way. Um, and these um, adaptations uh, allow to achieve a, a larger ecological yield and more carbon export. And the reason for that is, um, if we just look at this, um, this map here, so what I'm showing here is the balance of uh, autotrophic and heterotrophic um, acquisition of resources in terms of carbon, in terms of nitrogen, in terms of iron. So where it's purple, it's getting those resources from grazing. And this is just in the nano, intermediate nanoplankton size class um, because this is the one where it's got the sort of closest balance between autotrophy and heterotrophy. And you can see here in the low latitude, um, it's getting stuff from heterotrophy because nanoplankton are generally outcompeted for resources uh, in those uh, oligotrophic gyres. Um, so they switch to grazing on the, on the picophytoplankton. In the high latitude regions, um, there's more nutrients left over because there's a high nutrient supply and they can get more from autotrophy and green here. And you can see this just reflects the phytoplankton to zooplankton ratio in, those, um, in that size class. And it's very tightly coupled between different resources. If we go to the mixotrophic uh, model run, you can see that it's completely different. Um, so everywhere, it's getting most of its carbon from photosynthesis because this is in the surface of the ocean. Um, there's a lot of light available, so it's just really turning over um, carbon from photosynthesis. In terms of nitrogen acquisition, uh, it's getting a lot of nitrogen from inorganic nitrogen, where um, in these regions like the HNLC regions in the high latitudes where there's a lot of nitrogen available. And for the iron, it's the opposite situation. In the equatorial Pacific, um, where the uh, iron is uh, generally scarce. It's switching to heterotrophy to get that. And you can see also in the oligotrophic gyres, um, where it's, um, nitrogen is limiting, it's, it's switching to heterotrophy to get that. And you can see these patterns of nutrient stress reflecting that. So that's where it's switching to heterotrophy to balance its resource acquisition. So the, perhaps these, these cycles aren't as tightly coupled as before. Um, and just to get back to some of the data that Adam was showing this morning, um, what happens in this model is we see that there's a change in the ratio of carbon fixation to the ratio of limiting nutrients, be that, car be that nitrogen, be that iron, or be that phosphorus. Um, this is just a map of the carbon uh, fixation rate relative to whatever the limiting nutrient in that, most limiting nutrient in each region happens to be. Um, so you can see universally that's going up and it's becoming more efficient in terms of carbon. Um, you can see uh, so this is Adam's data here uh, with a box and whisker plots. 
Uh, the blue line is the classic uh, PZ model, and the, um, the red line is the mixotrophic model. So that flexibility is allowing to fix a lot more carbon in those oligotrophic nutrient-limited regions. Uh, and this is, uh, this is just a comparison of the model runs in terms, um, just to re-emphasize in terms of carbon biomass and primary production, the model is roughly the same. But we're seeing big changes in the uh, equivalent spherical diameter of the community and in terms of the carbon export. Um, so I'll just quickly say um, how important is mixotrophy? I have no idea because um, it's such an unconstrained problem. So we did this at sensitivity experiment and changed a few parameters in the model, details of which are not important. Um, but the fact is, as you, go, as you change these parameters and the fraction of mixotrophy goes up, these effects increase. And if we are truly living uh, with an ocean that is dominated by mixotrophy, then it's likely that its ecological and geochemical impacts are going to be high. Um, so I'm just going to have to skip over this because I'm going a bit over time. But um, I'll be happy to take questions. Anyway. Thank you. Hi, Ben. Uh, right here. So I just had a question about um, how it seems like an inefficiency in mixotrophy is that you need the apparatus to get, um, to get your food from both different sources. And so I'm wondering if you have modeled like having some mixotrophs but also some autotrophs and some heterotrophs and just kind of see if that gives you something that looks like the real world. Yeah, in fact, that's, that's what this, uh, this plot is here. It's um, sort of, this is the, the main run where there was no cost of being a mixotrope. You could do everything as well as um, phytoplankton or zooplankton. Here, there's a bigger penalty for combining. Uh, so there were three, three uh, guilds here. There were phytoplankton, mixotrophs, and zooplankton. Uh, Phil. Thanks for that uh, presentation, Ben. Uh, two quick things. Uh, firstly, did you attempt uh, an additional model run, maybe in terms of a sensitivity analysis, where in addition to uh, having your simplified food web, where you just have everything in terms of mixotrophs, did you also add in some more grazers on the mixotrophs, as might happen in the real world? So what we actually end up with, um, I don't know if I have a plot of that or not. Um, it's kind of, I don't have a plot of it, uh, but what happens is um, these kind of sort themselves out into, these ones end up being 100% phytoplankton because they've got no prey available. And these ones end up, because they've got such terrible nutrient uptake uh, traits, they don't do anything like that. They just eat things. So we do have the full suite of um, phytoplankton mixtropes and zooplankton, um, but they're not, that's not a put into the model, that's something that comes out of the model. I see. And then just the other point in terms of looking forward, the, it looks like the, the real key diagnostic might be that uh, sort of fourfold increase in size that you saw. And so the new generation of flow cams are doing a fantastic job in terms of really giving us the throughput and giving us the discrimination uh, that we need to maybe look at some of those things. So that might be a way forward. Uh, maybe if we can also come up with some selective staining or something like that. Yeah, I, I, what I was going to talk about in the ways forward was um, people like Diane and um, others have been working on mixotrophy for 30 years, um, and they've identified they know massive amounts about taxonomic groups, what they do, um, when they're doing it. So I think a key way forward is to look at observations of the ocean. Um, I'm thinking of CPR or tar oceans, uh, but FlowCam as well, um, and then kind of try and relate those taxonomic groups. Um, and that sort of mixed traffic classifications uh, to more, a more trait-based approach and try and make um, some generalizations about it so we can try and have this dialogue between the, the observationists and the trait-based models. Yeah. No, thank you. So why are there diatoms in the ocean? Why are there diatoms in the ocean? Um, <laughs> Maybe they're not mixotrophic because they want to have defense. 
Um, they want to have faster growth rates. I mean, they, they're very specialized uh, organisms, and they're very good at what they do. Um, but I wonder if, if their, their, their shell is something that stops them being mixed trophy, but they get an advantage from that. <laughs> Okay, thanks a lot, Ben.